So today we're going to take a look at one of the aspects uh, that's going to affect future world oil supply, and that, of course, is expiration. Now we're going to look at uh, both the UK and also a global overview of how the world has gone to sleep. So for the UK part, how many of the following facts did you know? The UK has benefited from five decades of North Sea energy. The UK is an energy importer. We spent £117 billion importing energy in 2022. Now, a lot of that is gas from Norway and from the continent and from LNG, but from other sources as well. And a lot of our oil is also imported. Gas provides more than 40% of electricity. So your EVs aren't quite as fossil fuel free as perhaps you realised. Oil and gas production supports over 200,000 jobs in the UK and it meets 76% of the UK energy requirements. That's the 2022 numbers. 32 million vehicles are fuelled by petrol and diesel and 24 million homes are heated by gas. So the North Sea is and will be at the heart of the UK's energy future for decades to come. So let's have a look at the looming energy crisis. This graph shows the fuel production and consumption in millions of tonnes of oil equivalent for the UK, running from 2000 to 2030. This is the data. I think this prediction was made a little earlier, but here we are today in the middle of 2023. And you can see oil has been on a steady decline for some decades, gas likewise. So this is our domestic production. Renewables, well, we can see that renewables has really expanded, but that hasn't really offset the decline in oil and gas. Uh, there are others in here, they're listed above. And what you see then is this line here, the black line, which is actual and then projected UK energy consumption. Now, it's actually shown to be declining. However, the amount of energy that we produce, our indigenous energy supply, leaves quite a significant gap between the two. And this gap we have to fill with imports of energy. Now, I'd like to spend a minute just talking about the domino effect. And this is in the oil arena. And here you can see SVT, Salomvo Terminal. It's up on the Shetland Islands and it's actually supplied by two systems. One is the Brent system pipeline, the other is the Ninian pipeline system. Now, these pipeline systems are actually fed by numerous fields. So you can see Brent's field by the Cormorant and North Alwyn plus satellites. Now, the Brent field itself has actually ceased production. So BSP carries no Brent anymore. That's gone. And then you've got the Ninian pipeline system that's really now down to just the uh, Ninian field and satellites tied back to it. Numerous fields up in the northern North Sea have ceased production. These include Hutton, Dunlin, Murchison, Heather, Thistle and others. Costs formerly shared by these fields now have to be paid by the remaining groups for the maintenance of the pipeline, the maintenance of the terminal, any upgrades, all the ongoing things. And of course, the companies are also looking to make a profit. At some point in the next few years, one or more of these fields are going to become uneconomic. And that's because oil fields just have declining production over time. Now, when one field ceases, it'll cause a cascade, a domino effect, and that will make everything uneconomic. And at that point, everything will cease production. The end will be relatively quick and, and it's coming quite soon. It's really kind of too late already to change the outcome. So this is actually going to affect that curve that shows how quickly uh, oil production is declining in the UK. There will be some events that will actually mean that some of these field terminations happen much sooner than we expect. Now, windfall taxes that have been introduced recently, they've accelerated the demise of the UK oil production, no doubt about that. Recent evidence comes from uh, Apache, who've decided that they'll no longer be drilling on any of their assets, so the 40s field area and the barrel field area, formerly very, very large hubs for hydrocarbon production in the UK. That's going to accelerate the decline in those fields. 
So some would say, well, yes, but renewables, they're going to be coming along and they're going to rescue the situation. Well, we look at offshore wind, we have huge databases on it, not just for the UK, but worldwide. And we see that uh, fixed wind has indeed been a major success. But as we now looking to deeper water and there we're looking at to floating wind now, talking with many companies in the supply chain, there are major supply issues and major challenges. A lot of that technology is yet to be proven. I think it will happen eventually, but it won't happen as quickly as perhaps the politicians are uh, anticipating. Offshore hydrogen, well, generally it seems to rely on spare wind capacity, and we wonder if there will actually indeed be any. I mean, you know, with a, a new network of connectivity with Europe and beyond, perhaps any wind power that's generated, any electricity, will be used and, and actually exported by the various interconnectors there may be. Also, hydrogen economics will be very challenging. We, we see that, again, it may happen, but it's still some time away from being a, a significant contributor. Offshore carbon capture, well, we've put these in blue because essentially carbon capture isn't really a renewable. It's waste disposal, what it is. Currently, the pace of progress is glacial. And by that, we mean... Nobody knows exactly what the tariff is going to be, if there's going to be a contract for difference, what the government is proposing for paying companies who actually dispose of the carbon dioxide. It has no intrinsic value. And uh, really, it comes down to, you know, how much will the taxpayer bear? I mean, they will pay, but how much can they afford to pay? Contributing industries will pass on costs to customers. So anyone that's got to uh, pay you know, cement business, for example, they're going to have to pass on the costs of the carbon tax and carbon levy uh, to their customers. Currently, there are four UKCS projects. They will deliver a tiny fraction of the storage required. Uh, delivery is very likely to be late. There are ongoing licensing rounds, but uh, again, the rate of progress is very, very slow. Well, offshore sailors put in there, but not really seen as being of any significant size. So a lot of this material is coming from the OE UK publications. And what you can see is they've looked and asked industry, what are the key investment challenges? And you can see them listed here. Well, all of them have issues and some of them have huge issues. Political support is a major issue. Tax rate and indeed Tax stability, the fact that the tax regime changes in the UK seemingly every few years, and it deters investment. You can see regulatory delays, supply chain availability, and access to workers and skills, all thought to be significant issues. Now, if we look at UKCS investment, new fields, it has been very, very low. This is for oil and gas. And sanctioned capital across the years has fallen really since a high back in 2011 and has fallen down in the 20s to very, very low levels indeed. We are not investing sufficient to actually offset the decline. So UK investments, very, very low. In 2022, we spent £62.6 .6 billion importing hydrocarbons to the UK. Domestic production is falling, imports will rise. Now, the security of supply, well, there's a new department being set up to actually look into that. Well, they'll have to work quickly because supply is being handed back to OPEC countries and they will control, the cartel will control the future of the oil price going forward. Now, let's have a look at the uh, global scene. Well, we're going to borrow from a great presentation that was done by Enveris. This was given recently both at BIOS and at the DevEx conference in the UK. Here you can see no car. That means no OPEC, Canada, America or Russia. So looking at the number of expiration wells that they hold in their database over a 70 year period. And you can see overlaying on here is the oil price. Now, it looked like through the 50s, 60s and into the 70s, things really just started to pick up here. And that was with the 1973 oil price hike. And uh, indeed, there it peaked in the 1980s. 
No, it seems to be a bit of a lag, but that's when all the exploration wells started to get drilled in response to that oil price. And of course, as supply increased, then the price fell away. We did not see the same effect here in the early 2000s. And other things have been going on in the world, as we know, the financial crisis of 2008 and numerous other world events that have impacted oil price. But you can see that uh, we're currently looking in the last decade or so at some of the lowest levels of exploration in these countries for over 70 years. In the oil and gas industry, we say that if we're not drilling wells, if we're not doing exploration, then we're not filling the hopper. It's not being topped up. The future demand, though it's expected to fall, it could be that uh, supply will fall faster. And without new opportunities, it'll be very, very difficult to meet that demand until prices go up, of course. Now, if we look at the last decade, you can see that uh, we've broken these out with Africa. You know, there's been a number of wells here, but not a huge number. There has been uh, Asia and the Far East has seen a lot of activity, but uh, Europe in the blues and Latin America. Latin America has oscillated in terms of uh, lots of activity in some years and, and very little in others. But generally speaking, these numbers for uh, all of these countries are actually very, very low in the sort of 30 range of wells. Now, based on this, Enveris have come up with a look at the global oil supply and uh, using actual data up until 2023 and then projections thereafter. Now, we've highlighted some of the uh, main producers there with the uh, USA, Canada, Russia, Saudi Arabia, so what we kind of see here is that the decline of many countries and many oil fields around the world is offset by a few large new production projects. So the likes of Guyana coming on stream recently, and it looks like Namibia should come on stream as a prolific oil production region before too long. But uh, there are huge ads from OPEC, USA, Canada, Russia, and China. These are the countries that are actually spending money, investing, and uh, growing their production. A great example that uh, Enveris showed is the decline here in a lot of the existing and, and mature assets in, in, in Brazil, here in this brown. But you can see the effect of the Buzios field, and uh, 11 FPSOs are going to be working on that field uh, before too long. It's going to really contribute a lot to maintaining and indeed increasing production over the next uh, decade or so. Mero is shown, and a number of fields here listed in the, in this green band is going to push Brazil's current production level from around about 3 million barrels of oil a day up to around about 5 million barrels of oil a day by the end of the decade. So here's the Inveris assessment for the Guyana Suriname Basin. And you can see that production has only recently started up here with uh, Lisa and Payara. A lot of these fields are actually in ExxonMobil Starbrook block, but others are across the border into Suriname. So there is a significant growth here coming from essentially no production back in 2020 times, but by uh, 2032, almost touching 2 million barrels of oil a day, a major contributing basin. So in summary, when we look globally, worldwide exploration has declined and it will result in a potential shortage going forward. Now, OPEC and the three superpowers will increasingly have control of supply, will increasingly have control of price, and the UK will just have to pay the going rate. Europe and Japan, likewise, they will really struggle to have a secure supply. There'll be a lot of competition to uh, actually secure long-term supplies of, of oil and gas, LNG, etc. And there will be competition which will push up prices. In the UK, well, we know that the supply is declining, imports are rising, costs inevitably will go up. A lot of people are saying it, but the carbon footprint to actually import gas and import oil, it has higher emissions than if we were to produce it from indigenous resources. In 2023, some 76 hubs are currently operating. It's anticipated that number will be about 25 by 
just after the, the turn of the decade. So very few hubs will be left producing going forward. There'll be lots of job losses like those recently announced uh, at uh, Harbour Energy. There'll be lower tax income for the government. There'll be very little wealth creation. All of the money will be going overseas. And uh, of course, limited security of supply. Overall, expect to pay higher costs for your energy. Thank you for watching. I hope you found that interesting. Please hit the like, subscribe and ring the bell. Hope to see you back on our channel before too long. Bye for now.